Um, I'm Mina Ishlar. I'm the moderator of this event. Um, I'm a lecturer at Center for Sustainable Studies, Lund University Luxus, which is the institution that organizes this event uh, for the future week. Um, well, I engage with social movements uh, through my research and where I do look at collective action initiatives and institutionalization of social movements within a southern context uh, and in the urban context mostly. So as a researcher, I'm really interested mm -hmm. to these discussions that we will have today. So uh, in this panel, we will basically discuss the future of social movements in, the, in relation to the current challenges we have, such as climate change, social injustices and inequalities, and now with the pandemic world. Um, before I introduce my speakers, I would just like to remind everyone also in YouTube that this is a hybrid event. So we have one speaker over Zoom, two speakers here. Uh, we have audience uh, in the room and we have audience online. So uh, I'll do my best to moderate a lively interaction, but bear with us if there are also some uh, delays. So um, it's, um, I'll just start now. We have three speakers, Frida Hulander. Uh, she's a climate psychologist and she's the co-author of the book, Climate Psychology, How Can We Ensure a Sustainable Change? We have uh, Håkan Johansson. Uh, Håkan is a sociologist and he's a professor at the School of Social Work, Lund University. He has an expertise in civil society and welfare. And we have Ulf Biereld over Zoom. Um, uh, Ulf is a professor at the Political Science Department in Gothenburg University with an expertise on civil society. And I'll give you more chances to uh, explain your works more in detail. Um, just to give a brief structure, what I have in mind is that I ask some general questions to our speakers um, for like a 20 minutes, half an hour, and then we'll get questions from the audience. And we also have questions that comes from the YouTube audience through use of Mentimeter. Um, so, Ulf, do you hear us well? So yes, I, wanna, I hear you. Great. So I want to invite you to the, to the room by asking basically a general question. How does your work relate to social movements and um, theories of change in general? Well, thank you, and thank you for having me. Uh, in my research, I compare uh, social movements with political parties, and I focus on similarities and differences in their strategies, in their actions, and in their functions in a representative democracy. We know, as you surely also know, that citizens today are uh, not less political interested and not less political engaged today than they were before. Mm -hmm. But there is one important difference, and that is that the people today, the citizens today, the politically engaged citizens today, do not use the political parties as platforms for their political engagement. They turn the political parties uh, their back, so to speak. And in my research, I put the questions uh, how we can explain this development. Why are the politically engaged uh, citizens today turning their backs to the political parties? And is there anything the political parties can do to change this development? And above all, what does this development mean for the political democracy? That is my research question on, on this field. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, Frida, you want to continue also how your work relates to social movements? Yes, so um, I'm a psychologist working with um, the climate issue or the climate issues rather. And I think for a very long time, um, sort of the narrative around what individuals can do to, um, to take part in the climate um, work has been very focused on very like individual consumer choices. So we've been very encouraged to buy eco-friendly um, stuff or we've been very encouraged to buy train tickets instead of flight tickets. We've been encouraged to buy vegetarian food instead of meat. Um, and 
And I think also uh, from a, psycho a psychological perspective, I think the focus has been a lot of on how can we facilitate that type of behavioral change. So I think what, what uh, myself and my colleagues also working, or psychologists also working on the climate, uh, the climate issue, um, one of our main focuses have has been to start shifting that discourse from that very individual consumer-focused perspective into a broader, um, just like a broader view of what types of behavioral changes we need to, um, to, to tackle the climate crisis. And I think that's where social movements come in, because engaging in social movements is also a behavior mm. that we do. It's also, and it's probably one of the most important behavior that we can um, perform uh, when working mm. um, to tackle the climate crisis. So I think that's my, my connection to the social to movements. Yeah. yeah, great. And Hokan. Uh, yeah, it's a good question. Uh, I do a little bit, bit like Ulf. I, I do the two answer question, the two answer to the same question. So I, I wanted to consider myself as a so social movement scholar, because in, in uh, for instance, in sociology, that is, uh, well, it's a sub-discipline almost uh, in a way. Um, however, I study much more of the organized expressions of civil societies in terms of the uh, formal org organizations or associations. And of course, as all of us know, the, the uh, distinctions between movements and organizations are usually quite blurred in the meaning that um, social movements, when they start to mobilize, they come across by the benefits of organizations or networks. And so these two t different types of, of uh, collective behavior or collective action is, of course, interrelated so my but my empirical focus has been mainly on the organizational side of civil society rather than on the social movements however in the last years i've been uh, uh, happy to be involved in studies of the uh, fridays for futures and so we uh, was part of uh, the swedish teams doing loads of surveys with uh, uh, protest participants so it was a huge collective effort in i think it's 20 cities or across the world so um, me and some colleagues here in Lund, we did studies in, of the Malmö demonstrations and colleagues in, in Stockholm and Gothenburg. So I think it's both empirical but also theoretical interest into social movements. Yeah, and hopefully we'll get back to your findings of that research yeah. more or less later in the discussions. Um, great, so we, I want to continue it off because um, I think this is one of the reasons why we kind of arranged this uh, panel is that we also realized more and more people drop out from party politics and are hesitant to take membership in party politics. And why do you think so? Do you, do you have some uh, explanations for that? Wolf? Yes, I think I have uh, two explanations they, and they connect with each other. The first uh, reason for why people uh, turn the back to the political parties today is that our political parties was created in a completely other time during the industrial society and the political cleavages which characterized the, the, the industrial society, especially the left-right uh, dimension. Of course, the left-right dimension is uh, still there. It had changed its nature, but it's still there. But it is also challenged by other conflict dimensions. And the political parties have difficulties to, to relate to this new uh, conflict uh, dimensions. So the political parties must uh, modernize themselves, both to their form, how they work, their organizations, but also in their ideolo ideological uh, uh, policies, so they better can, uh, can meet the, the challenges which characterize uh, the new society after the industrial society. That's the first explanation. They tend to be unmodern, the, the political parties today. But the other reason which are connected with the first one is that we live in a society today, society today which is much more individualized than the society was before. Uh, I will say that we live in a time where no society before us 
has been so individualized as uh, Sweden is today. And what does that mean? Uh, that means that we have other values in other countries and before the Swedish people valued collective values like family, religion, nation, history, religion and so on. Today, when another prioritizing it, uh, prioritize uh, uh, individual freedom, individual rights and uh, self-realization and independence. And that has consequences. That have cons has consequences for their political engagement. Uh, the, the individualized voter today uh, choose to, to seek connections where you, can where you can develop your political engagement in a way you yourself want to do it. Uh, instead of joining a political party and, uh, and take responsibility for a complete policy, you choose to connect to networks where you can pick what you are most interested of. If it's gender issues or peace issues or green issues, you can, you can choose it. And it's also much easier to be part of a network where you can choose yourself when you want to do your your mission and when you want to be active and do not need to join the often, I must say, rather boring political meetings that the political parties uh, organize. So that's the two explanations. The society is changing and the society is much more individualized today. That leads to problems for the political parties. Thank you. For, I think it's very good insights also to, to kind of link back to what you are doing. I think from a climate psychology perspective, because maybe you can explain to us a bit more in an individualized society, what does so social movements mean? So why do social people join to social movements? To, to find a network or what yeah. else? And I think that I can speak mostly um, with regards to the climate movements or why people engage in, in climate um, climate movement. I Perhaps you can speak more to... or more to social movements in general. Um, it seems as though one thing that um, um, that increases sort of the chances of someone engaging in the climate movement or partaking in that more collective action is if if you have if you can also make that sort of political connection that or regarding or viewing the climate crisis as a political issue. Um, or something that's influenced by the global politics or the national politics. But then also having a sense of one's own values as being politicized in some way. So, so finding that there's some sort of connection there. Also having a moral or feeling a moral obligation um, to act or to do something. So I think that those are some of the more sort of value-based mm. um, factors that that influence whether people engage in uh, in the climate movements but then uh, there are also of course other factors that come into play um, such as for a person like what's going on around that person what are the social norms that surround a certain person uh, if a person is hanging out with other people that are very politically engaged or very engaged um, engaged in their society, then there's a higher chance that you also, you know, that that becomes uh, more accessible. Um, and um, other factors such as what's available in the city where you live, like how high is the threshold for, you know, s going to a first meeting or going to your first demonstration or... Yeah. It's kind of a learning. Uh, yeah, as well. yeah, and I, I think um, there can also be some factors that influence that first step, but other factors that influence whether someone continues to um, take that collective action or continue their engagement. And going back to what Ulf was saying also about this ideological mm -hmm. um, strands, and now it's more value-based movements, can also be, you say, something related with accessibility. So perhaps people weren't this uh, black and white when they joined to a value-based movements, but in the ideological movements, they actually have to 
have an explicit political stand. Could that be, I wonder, one of the reasons why this collectivity among ideologies now disappearing because individuals want to also share values in a different way. Or you, you want me or? You, you can answer. Yeah. Um, so just, um, so if people, can you repeat the question? I would just yeah. wonder, and this can be also linked yeah. back to Hawkins' survey mm. probably, or the, the work that you did, is that why, what are these um, ideas that makes um, groups not align around ideology, but actually around these values, um, value-based movements uh, that we were talking about, about it could be climate, but it could be also mm, other okay. kind of... So, so rather forms, than, yeah. rather than uh, centering around that sort of left-right yeah, ideology... I mean, which, which we people, said boring, yeah, okay, but yeah, yeah. at the same time, it's more clear-cut mm -hmm. uh, when it comes to values, so it can't be accessible for everyone. Mm. Yeah, and perhaps you can speak more to that. Yeah, I think I could chip in a little bit yeah. on that one. Uh, I think it partly relates to what Ulf talked about before, that the parties as kind of a societal structure uh, is falling grounds in a way in, in their capacity to actually mobilize the large numbers. And of course, you can see that on, uh, you can see it in membership, in terms of union membership, Sweden still holds high, but declining. If you're looking in European comparative perspective, the, the density of union membership is perhaps 10 or 20 percent, which were some decades ago really high. You see it in uh, membership in political parties. You see it also in membership in, in civil society organizations, that they, it's also declining, at least in some areas. So, so to say, the established institutionalized structures of interest or ideologies is in that respect, so to say, a little bit deteriorating, uh, or at least losing grounds. Uh, and of course, that's also reflected in the streets. I mean, I mean the f first of May marches, you can see that, well, it's, it's not really bringing out the big crowds anymore. Mm. So compared to other, if we call them value-based, I'm not sure if we should use that word at times, <laughs> they're also quite ideological, yeah. uh, but they are not tied to, to the classic ideologies or the divides in terms of left and right. Uh, when it comes to who actually participates and why, I think that quite a lot of the classic explanations actually still holds true, in the meaning that still it's the grievance that, that brings people to the streets and into the movements, that there is some kind of felt injustice why you should be involved, why you should be engaged. So even though we think about a highly more individualized society, it's still there, that there is, so to say, a felt injustice, and felt could be very physical as well, of course, uh, that people actually are joining a movement or an organization. Uh, and then, of course, it comes to the other more meta-level explanations in terms of the social networks, the social capitals, if you have friends involved, uh, and of course also class and, and the gender also plays a role. And then I think it's also accidental factors in terms of, well, where you are living mm. uh, and the Greta effect, of course, mm. in the last years mm. with the high media recognition and played a, a huge role, both in spreading movements across the globe, uh, but of course also bringing and mobilizing people into the streets. And in this case, of course, the young people. Yeah. So and there is a generational effect. And I think we're also talking about it a little bit between the the old uh, 20th century movements uh, and the more, uh, well, present-day movements in a way. And uh, maybe the young people, because they can't join the party politics because of their age, or would it be more comfortable, for instance, to take part in a social movement since they can't vote and this is their yeah. form of political participation? Well, I guess they could, you know, theoretically uh, join the youth uh, whatever that's called in English, well, yeah, the Ungdomsförbunden. Yeah. Yeah. Youth branches. Um, yeah, but I guess they don't. Uh, well, can just, yeah. uh, can yes, I please we'll uh, yes. can jump in? Yes, jump in about uh, the youth branches. That's correct. Uh, formally, they could uh, join the youth branches, but the youth branches are not there. They are not visible. They are not playing an important role in the society today. So if you are politically interested and you are a youth, why should you join a youth branch when you could join a social movement? Uh, so uh, I think the, the 
the youth branches of the political parties have big difficulties answering that question. I can also just uh, fill in about the individualization. It's it expressed also in the fact that the connection between class and voting are declining today, the so-called class voting. Before, if you knew which class a citizen uh, was belonging to, you could also, with uh, rather good predictability, tell us if this person voted left or this person voted right. So isn't it today the differences between the proportion of the working class and the middle class who votes for socialist parties is uh, constantly decreasing and declining? So the, the connection between uh, which class you belong to and which party you vote on is much weaker today than it was before. And that is also an expression of individualization. So the, so the definition of what is being, I mean, who is politicized or what's politicized is now maybe changing. Because you also mentioned in your talk that people are not less politicized today. It's just they're politicized in terms of party politics. Do you agree with that? Yeah, I think so. <laughs> that's, that's what we are referring to in various ways. That, uh, mm. I mean, the, the parties are less relevant. And there are so many other forms and expressions of political activities that are much more relevant mm. for, for, well, the people today. And I think that we are, we are talking ha here as we were digital dinosaurs in a way, mm. uh, in the meaning that, well, uh, we, we can't uh, avoid that social media in its all various expressions, of course, change, change the platforms for political parties and social movements, mm -hmm. uh, of course, here as well. And, and it's, uh, it's difficult for the organized actors, either at the parties or the organizations, and partly perhaps also the movements. They, they need to adjust because the individuals are less loyal, they are much more fluid, and they are perhaps also, well, changing ideas at hand. But I would also say, at least in, in the climate movement, that there's, there's both a desire for the climate issue to, be, to not be reduced to a partisan mm. issue, but rather be like a broader issue than that, even though we perceive it as a political issue that we don't want it to be, or that many people don't want it to be reduced to um, a partisan issue. Um, and then I think also that in combination with many, many people who are engaged in the climate movement feeling extremely frustrated with the political parties mm. and feeling as though there's no political party doing enough. And uh, with that, perhaps um, have quite a low um, trust or faith in the political parties as, as a forceful actor um, to to creating the the changes necessary to tackle the climate crisis. Um, so, it, so I think at least in the climate movement that there um, there's a view that there are other ways that might be more efficient than engaging in that more sort of traditional um, political mm -hmm. parties. And how does um, how do climate movements envisage a political action then? because it's still a strike in front of a parliament. So there is a, some form of expectation, perhaps, that parliamentary politics will do the political mm. action. Because yeah. otherwise, what is it that the ac action will come from? Um, Enio, if you can answer this <laughs> question. Yeah, uh, so when, when we did a little bit of surveys mm. with some of the uh, participants in these Fridays for Future demonstrations, and ask them both on, on terms of, well, all these social background factors uh, and uh, demographic factors and, and, of course, also why they participated. I think that one, one of the answers that also stood out, in a way, was that they have strong uh, reliance on experts, mm. uh, in the meaning of experts as scientists, perhaps, or other forms of experts. And they even, on the question whether they, so to say, wanted governments to act on the experts' uh, uh, expectations, even though it was opposing people's will, they said yes and strongly agreed. So I think that there is, so to say, a very strong expert orientation at the moment, both in the climate movements mm -hmm. 
but also also perhaps in this broader discussions about climate change as such where so to say we we have to trust the scientists mm. and therefore of course the the connection to the political party changes because they feed in all the data uh, and that's uh, we should trust the scientists is perhaps so to say the political message mm. coming out from some of these movements at least and thus again science has very solutions um, but it's not something that everyone agrees on no because we see for instance in paris yellow west movements that uh, there were tensions and the movement started because some of the mitigation policies have been imposed on people without necessary consultation. So that listening science or an expert community didn't really lead to a conciliation in the society. So, um, Ulf, do you want to add something onto this discussion before I open up for the audience questions? Yes, I can say something about mobilization, because uh, it's true, as uh, Håkan said before, before that uh, social movements uh, mobilize uh, the, the citizens. That's great, that's good. The problem is that in a democratic representative system like Sweden, it is the political parties uh, who should have that function, because that it, it is the political parties which can uh, link the citizens' uh, political opinions to political suggestions and put them in in the decision-making institutions like the parliament. Uh, so that's great that social movements articulate and aggregate people's will, so to speak, but the problem is that this will must be distributed into the decision-making institutions. And uh, Therefore, I want to see more cooperation between the political parties and the social movements, to, so the social movements can help the political parties to fulfill the party's function as a link between the people and the parliament. So, uh, but on both sides, both from the social movements and from the political parties, there is a fear of touch, because you do not want to be partisan in, in, in that sense from the social movements and the political parties are a little afraid for things they don't understand and things they can't control. So we have a democratic problem here. Yeah. Uh, we also see in relation to this some cases where social movements are mobilizing election campaigns or trying to help the grassroots candidates around the world, in, in Spain, for instance, in US now. Uh, do you see something similar that can happen in Sweden? for instance, where the grassroots politician uh, movements get together and try to affect the election campaign? I think that, I mean, uh, some of the political parties in Sweden are movement parties in a way. Mm -hmm. I mean, the Social Democrats and, and, the, and the Greens are certainly expressions of it. So, I mean, they always have that, that kind of perhaps sometimes more historical connection than present connection. Um, but at the moment, I don't see it in that way, even though, of course, the Social Democrats are mobilizing forces mm -hmm. before elections. Yeah. So that's not so unlikely to think about pol party, pol party politics separate from movements, because historically we also see that kind of through. Um, one question I have for you, Frida, before again I open up, uh, is we talked about how climate, action, uh, climate movements frame their demands, and one, one was political action. Mm -hmm. And the other thing we, I always see is this emergency framing. Mm -hmm. So how does emergency framing help for change from uh, your perspective as a climate psychologist? I would say that framing something as an emergency can be a good way of alerting people um, that, you know, something is going on here and we need to act. Um, to, to tackle the emergency somehow. Um, I, think the, I think the problem with um, the emergency framing in the climate issue is one that it's, it hasn't, and it's still not for everyone that evident why it is an emergency. It's still not perceived um, by everyone as an acute emergency. Well, certainly in places around the globe, uh, you know, it is an acute emergency, but I think still for a lot of people, there's like a dissonance between that framing and what we're experiencing. Mm -hmm. 
So I think the the, the risk with that framing then is that it, it becomes like a word you repeat uh, without really, really, you know, tapping into that. Because I think with the emergency framing, you 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 want to tap into people's emotions somehow, mm -hmm. you know, and make, alerting them. Um, I think like the other problem with it is that if we alert people that there's an emergency, but don't really follow up with, okay, so what, what comes next? Like, what do we do next after we've been alerted? Like after we've reached that um, crisis awareness, what comes next? I think that can, worst case, produce some sort of um, feeling of hopelessness or um, um, not being able to control. So I'm, I'm, I, you know, I think it has, I think we do need to alert people, but I don't think that that framing is enough. Mm. And I think that's sort of, so we were speaking about um, Fridays for Future before, and I think that like that's um, their message. You know, we want to alert people. We want to, we want to have everyone become aware of the crisis we're in, but then they're not saying anything about the solution. So they're repeating, so we need to listen to the scientists. But then, you know, nothing about what comes next. They sort of leave the solutions to... To others. To others, whether that be uh, the political parties or the institutions or um, companies or whomever. Mm -hmm. So I think I think an emergency framing, you know, it has its pros and cons. I don't think that that in itself is enough to, to create start a change. No. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Um, now I would like to open the floor for the audience. Uh, if you have questions, please shoot now. Yes. <coughs> and I will repeat your question because some people cannot hear in the online world. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, I'll just repeat the question so Ulf also can hear. Um, so the comment was about the having more activist voices in these type of panels. But the question was that do we need then new forms of democracy if we see this much decline in party politics? You can start Ulf if you're ready. It depends, of course, like so much other things in the world, it depends. Uh, foremostly, it depends about how the political parties will meet the, this, uh, this challenge. Will they come back? Do they have any possibilities to come back? I like the representative democracy. I can't see any better system uh, today if you want to combine the fulfillment of the public will with the individual human rights. But uh, the whole system depends on that the political parties manage to fulfill their function, their role as a link between the political party, the, the public and the, the people and the, and the police. So, but will they do it? Can they do it? Yes, I think they have a chance. Uh, I have, as maybe many of you know, myself been active in politics in the Social Democratic uh, Party. And I think I can speak for other parties too, that they are an insight about the problem. They know the problem. They can speak about the problem. 
That's not the problem. <laughs> the problem is that they do not have the tools to solve it. They do not know what to do. I know it's uh, work going on in uh, lots of parties, how they shall break this negative trend and again become relevant for, for, uh, for, uh, for, for the people and for the engage, politically engaged citizens. So uh, the problem insight is there, the solutions are not there, but I think there is a possibility for the solutions to come. And in that case, we do not need another form of democracy we can develop the form of democracy we have now. Okay, thank you. Yeah, it's a good question. <laughs> of course, it's two good questions. Why the, the first one, I don't know. Uh, you need to ask the organizers. Uh, on the second one, uh, I will try not to pass. Uh, I, for the sake of the debate, I, I think uh, I disagree with, uh, with my colleague in, in Gothenburg. Uh, I would assume that we will find such a higher voting behavior in the meaning because of the, the polarization and, and the conflicts that we express. So more people will go voting, but I don't think that that turns the parties more relevant. Uh, I think that our ways of doing democracy at the moment is struggling of finding the new, the new or the alternative or the complementary ways of doing it. I would also think that the more institutionalized uh, corporatist ways of, of adding up to the political parties uh, that we've done before is also losing ground. We can find a number of indicators that shows that. Decline in membership, uh, of course the distance between the members of the grassroots and those actually at the top of these interest groups and organizations. So that doesn't really seem to work either. Um, most political institutions of various kinds, they, they uh, experiment with online consultations, uh, various forms of trying to involve people. The problem with that is, of course, that they are not so legitimate in a way. You never know who really answers. Uh, so everyone is seeking the solution, but it seems to be hard to find. So uh, in that way, it seems like a more gloomy picture, for the, at least for the representative forms of democracy that we are relying on, and if we're going to continue to rely on the political parties. Thank you. Yes. Or maybe I'll, uh, we'll take Matilda first. Sorry. <laughs> So I'll try to yeah I'll try to summarize this just a question in general to all of you hopefully <laughs> with one sentence I can say is that this feeling of left, left behind how is that actually relevant for social movements mm -hmm. and is that a mobilizing factor basically because we're talking about depoliticization of the society but people are politicized also in the way that they actually feel left behind because there are these gaps between urban and rural, but also like climate movements, which 
which is more middle class and um, white groups or young people versus uh, others. Mm -hmm. uh, so can we afford to be actually in a movement that is also um, in different uh, class? Mm. Um, yeah. yeah. So, if I, so if I were to speak um, to that from a very sort of emotional perspective, um, I would presume that that feeling of being left behind evokes uh, feelings of anger, frustration, um, irritation, um, disappointment perhaps, uh, which also relates to the feeling of anger. And we know that anger is, is and has historically been a very sort of potent motivator for change and motivator for taking action and trying to um, setting the balance straight. So, so seeing some sort of injustice and wanting to take action to um, to even out that injustice. So, in that way, I would I would presume that f that feeling of left behind. If there are numerous people that are feeling left behind that can organize, I think that could probably be a very sort of potent uh, driver for change. I think it's trickier if you're feeling left behind and alone, you know, and having no one else to, um, to act with. Um, and then I think, I think that one of, because that's a very important thing that you bring up with the, also the, the, the justice perspective within the climate uh, movement. And I think that's a real challenge that all climate movements have is how to be inclusive enough. Uh, and I think there's always this um, ongoing conflict or ongoing debate on how, like how inclusive should we be? How radical should we be? Can we be rad radical and um, risking of losing some people? Um, whose perspective are we taking? You know, who are we speaking for? Can we speak for everyone? Can we speak for all human beings? Can we speak for all um, animal species? All, um, you know, or do we need to? Do we need to sacrifice? someone or sacrifice something and I, th I do think that this is one of the main challenges that the climate movement has to tackle yeah. mm -hmm. All right. uh, Ulf we can take you next um, maybe it's a little off topic but uh, maybe not I didn't hear the whole question so, so I'm not sure but when we speak about uh, social movements today it's uh, sometime I think we we presuppose that social movements must be progressive, progressive, but of course they do not need to be that. Of course, that in its turn depends on how we define a social movement. But if you look at the new nationalistic wave in, in Europe and in, in, in the world, the popular right, so to speak, I think uh, I'm not an expert of individual motives behind uh, political engagement, but uh, what I have read, I, the theories about it is that the, mobilisi the mobilization behind the, the alternative right or the popular right or how you want to describe it, name it, uh, where it is a feeling of being left behind. So they do not want to change the society in a progressive way, do not want to develop it in that way. They want to have the old things back, so to speak. Uh, the new movements, the, the progressive movements, like the environmental uh, movement, the, the, the climate uh, movement, and so on. Um, I do not think, uh, as a, on a collective level, uh, its progress and its success depends on a feeling of being left behind. But I agree with Frida, a lot of anger and, and uh, also a collective identity. Uh, because they who fight for this environment often are, are so young. And we have a paradox here uh, in Sweden uh, with Greta and her great international success in Sweden's history to be early, uh, only, uh, to be early on the track on, on, on these issues. The Green Party in Sweden uh, is not so big if you compare with in ma many other uh, countries. 
So that's another question. Uh, maybe we should not discuss it here today. But why do not the Green Party uh, succeed in uh, mobilizing the great interest in green issues and the great uh, progress of the of the green movement into votes for their own party? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thanks for an interesting and reflective uh, question and comment here. So I did studies on, on these Fridays for Futurists at the same time as I, I did interviews with the gasoline uprising. So if you have heard of the gasoline uprising in Swedish that means Benzin Uproret 2.0, which brought together huge numbers of individuals, of members, of followers on Facebook, hundreds of thousands of them, on one single issue in the meaning of lower taxes on gas. And I think that these two, uh, mobilizing at the same time, different platforms, of course, uh, shows that, well, it goes back and forth, that there is the, so to say, the pro progressive and the less progressive, if we call it that. Uh, this gasoline up uprising, they didn't consider themselves as uh, anti-environmental, certainly not. They thought of themselves as a way of trying to pro protect the possibilities of li living in the countryside. At least that was the, so to say, the main motivation, according to the organizers. So here we, I mean, we see the well. There is different, so to say, basis for different movements, and the problem I assume for for both the environmental and even more so on the climate movements is that they they want to raise a topic and an issue that concerns all. But the problem is that they only mobilize a few in the meaning that they mobilize the middle class or the upper middle class, they mobilize the well-educated, they mobilize those in cities in the meaning of the, the urban residents. However, they are less relevant for those in the countryside. So here we have, of course, the new tension or divide uh, or, or even cleavage between the urban residents with the well, better possibilities of, of a future uh, compared to those living in the rural areas. And we see, of course, that in in many European countries at the same time. So the, the problem here is that movements actually become relevant for a wide group of, of citizens. That's, that's difficult <laughs> in a way. And even more so if turning into a political party that can be even more relevant to, to many. Mm. So I think that's, uh, that's the so to say, dilemma, at least for, from the environmental and, and the greens and the climates. Okay, thank you very much. Now we will take questions from our YouTube audience. We have uh, two questions, we'll bring them into one. The first question is, if you want quick change, why, you, why not be in a social party and vote kind of at the same time, because you get a double win. Uh, so it's the fastest uh, way to make change to vote. And then uh, if you can give some examples of where maybe where a social movement has had one single issue or cause, and you've seen kind of political action then being brought based on this, uh, this kind of campaign. So was the first one a question? Um, Ulf was saying that, I said, if, uh, um, if we want quick change, should we join a party? Mm. And to summarize mm, that. Okay. Yeah. okay, interesting, yes. Can we do both? <laughs> yeah. Yes. <laughs> All right, uh, should we start with you, Frida? Or well, I, or Ulf, I, I would love to hear Ulf's take on, okay. on that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, one, I, I think we start with the second question. Uh, I think the impact social movements do in politics, it is seldom to to succeed in, in a, a specific decision. I think the success of social movements is their ability to bring issue and issue areas on the political agenda. We talk a lot of climate and, and green issues today, and I am absolutely sure we had not spoke so much about them if the Greta phenomenon, for example, had not ha had been existed. So social movements put things on the agenda and put pressures to the political parties to act in the parliament. And uh, that I see in the green issues, I can see it in the children's rights issues, in peace issues, in disarmament issues, and so on. But it's uh, more difficult to find a single issue and say this specific decision 
was uh, a victor was uh, created by by the social movement where impact is more indirect in in that way and the first question if i understood it right if you shall uh, want a, 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 a quick a quick change a quick decisions i would say in politics there very seldom is things like uh, quick fixes uh, politics needs uh, patience and 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 uh, time but sometimes when the things are uh, acute or, 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 or in a hurry. Um, I think in the refugee, we're not talking about the refugee issues and migration politics today. Uh, the Swedish law, I do not want to try to say what it is in English, Gymnasielagen, <laughs> the law who helped uh, uh, some lonely coming uh, uh, refugees, young refugees, in, to, to stay in Sweden and uh, and and study for for a couple of years. I think uh, the, the social movements and the civil society uh, made a great impact on on that uh, decision. And okay, it took its time, but uh, as I said, politics often takes time. Can I just add on to what Ulf was saying um, about? Um how so social movements uh, impact uh, various issues. Uh, and I agree that it's usually hard to say, like, was it this specific movement that that directly uh, impacted this specific uh, political decision? But I, I think it's interesting to look at the very recent case of, of Prem. Mm -hmm. um, Prem? Raf? Is that the English yeah. word? Raf? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, where there has been a very um, targeted campaign uh, against the expansion of the PrimRAF, um, which has been which has been going on and which has been um, very persistent, so to speak. And I think that and now, obviously, like Prem withdrew their application, saying that it's it's no longer commercially um, sustainable to to move forward with the expansion of of the RAF. Um, and I mean, it's it's always hard to say, like, was it like how much was that decision influenced by the activists who persisted? How much did the activists um, raise the uh, um, raise awareness on this? issue and um, make this issue more um, known to the general public, which created more of um, um, like a more active public opinion against the issue. You know, it's always so there are always different factors that come into play. Um, but I think for a lot of activism, I think that like that's also the goal of, ra you know, raising awareness, um, sp um, cr creating more public opinions around it, um, and also delaying some um, decisions, delaying investments, delaying, you know, and that's, so that's, you know, that's part of the goal. But I think that's, that's uh, an interesting, very recent issue where, you know, we can at least speculate um, that the, the very targeted activism did Im influence the politics and also the decision mm -hmm. that Prem yeah. made. Yeah. Exactly. Do you have anything to add, Hogan? I think uh, the uh, the person asking the question got lovely answers from my colleagues here on, <laughs> on the examples of impact. When it comes to uh, how do I do quick change? <laughs> uh, yeah, um, that's hard to tell in a way. Um, I would assume that, uh, for instance, social media campaigning is quite effective these days, especially as politicians tend to be quite responsive to them. Uh, and uh, know that they need to be, so to say, looking out to the social media influences perhaps more than uh, some of the movements in a way. So I think that if one, w if one wants to do uh, change on this topic, that could be uh, one advice in a way. Uh, we are not talking about business here. We are not talking about markets. Mm. Uh, I mean, quick change, try to influence the big companies. Uh, of course, that's uh, e less less easy than than done. But I think they are also holding some of the keys to alongside the politicians here, if if change is going to happen at all. Um. Yeah. I guess it's also had to do a lot with what people's expectations with change. That change takes time, 
even in parts politics, but also for social movements to reach their demands. Mm -hmm. Maybe these small vic victories, there is more awareness, maybe motivation to continue. Mm -hmm. But when you look at historically, social movements took their time and still struggling for maybe similar issues after mm -hmm. 100 years. So we maybe are very uh, eager to, to do more things in a short time. Uh, and this also contradicts with the emergency and climate discourse, of course, mm -hmm. that's running now, that we need action now, and, but that mm -hmm. will take time. So I'll take one more question from the audience. Yes. Okay. So you think emergency framing can help to decontextualize structurally? Hmm. I'm not sure I understood the whole uh, de like um, taking it out of its historic context and taking it out of and and. So if I have to rephrase your question, if you allow me, <laughs> that the question is that where do you find yourself structurally or collectively, individually of this emergency framing? Because emergency framing can help also to shake this normalized mm. uh, context that we are in and suddenly can decontextualize the issues so that we can look at it from a more alerted perspective, I guess. Mm. I can do a little bit of interpretation on that question. Uh, I, I think that uh, emergency is, of, ki of course, difficult in a way. It's, it's kind of playing Russian roulette in a way. Mm. That if you push the emergency card too much, mm. then, then, of course, people start to, uh, well, perhaps question, is it still emergency? Or why should we be alerted to the same degree as we was last year or the year before, or perhaps even 20 years before? And I would assume that that's also one of the reasons why uh, people start questioning, is there, a, so to say, an environmental emergency at all? Or that they don't care anymore, that due to the emergency and that we really can't change it, we don't care. Things might go to hell and, uh, and we can't really do anything about it. So I think that the emergency card in, in mobilizing people or politicians uh, is, is could go uh, not so well. And I think we see it, at least partly, in terms of the uh, well, various forms of uh, denials or expressions or uh, how people come together due to that reason, that they stop believing either in the emergency or in the cause as such. So I think that's, that's kind of a, if that would be a structural explanation into it, perhaps. <laughs> I think that one thing that also makes at least the climate issue, um, you know, complex in one way and and hard to really take that required action is that, you know, we, um, and when I say we now, I mean, so, so we in the wealthier part of the world, we are the ones who have created the emergency. Like we're the ones in the emergency, we're the ones who created the emergency. And in order to tackle the emergency, we also need to, um, to, to, to change um, the conditions that brought us, brought us here in the first place. So I think um, a challenge, even for a lot of people who are very engaged in the climate issue and in the climate work is that, almost that sense of being sitting on 
two chairs at the same time. Um, so both sort of being a potential victim of the emergency, but also being the predator, you know, that, that caused the emergency. And I think that's, um, that makes it a little bit more complicated as compared to perhaps other social movements where it's a more sort of clear cut, um, you know, they are the ones who've caused this and we are the ones who are the victims so we can fight, you know, them. Like that's the goal for us. But I think that's a little bit more complex in the climate um, movement or in the when, when working on climate, um, the climate issue. Right. Yeah. Yes. Uh, I'll get one more question from YouTube. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. Um, this is the question. What role uh, do you see for increased participatory democracy? For example, Extinction Rebellion in the UK, that they have citizen assemblies that you also have in Ireland and in Australia. Uh, no, in France. Uh, so kind of um, extended democracy. Yes, I, I think, I mean, they put uh, pressure on Macron uh, on his grand debates as one illustration. So, so I mean, these forms of participatory democracy, they, they certainly put pressure on the established parties and politicians to start listening, perhaps to keep their power, but still, uh, they put pressure. So that would be my, my answer to that question, definitely. And I, I think that something like that can really, when talking about the issue of feeling left behind or feeling um, that sense of hopelessness, I think that, you know the, the more we can give more people a sense of being part of, you know, of having uh, a power to to create change. I think the better uh, in terms of also like fostering long term, more long term engagement. Um, I think if, if as long as people feel as though, you know, there's nothing we can do, no one's listening to us, you know, then we end up with feeling like, you know, we might as well go to bed instead. Yeah. And uh, I guess in, in case of Extinction Rebellion, there, as you say, it's very explicit about we don't only rely on the power on the institutions, but we have to take the power back. Mm -hmm. To people, so this all these citizen assemblies is a practice of, also learning practice of how to do democracy, at a grassroots level where democracy had been now taken back to the people, mm. but not only to the institutions. So they're quite explicit about this most rebellious part of activism, mm. rather than reformist. Yeah. Questions more. Is it a follow-up or? <laughs> okay. That was my final question, Matilda. <laughs> 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 but the question is, now with the COVID pandemic, would it change? What we aspire for change, would, it, would COVID-19 pandemic change what we aspire for change? Oof. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you left the easy question for me, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, of course, we cannot know anything about that uh, yet, uh, but uh, I think one difference will be that uh, maybe so, maybe not so much in politics in the first place, but in our ways to live our lives. Uh, I think uh, we will see uh, a progress for digitalization. We have uh, today we sit here in different rooms in different arenas from different links and so on. Uh, I think we'll, this will be more the, the normal way to, to, this mix will be the more normal way to work and this uh, uh, technology, technology will develop very, 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 very fast. Um, I also think maybe it's 
because of pandemic or maybe it, it's not, but I think the necessity for, for successful social movements to broaden their, their agendas because the issues uh, are, are linked together. I think it will be more useful, useful for uh, social movements who work with climate issues to also work with refugee issues and maybe also with inequality issues. And I also think we will meet the landscape for social movements if they do not cooperate with political parties, which I argue for, they at least will cooperate more with each other. So more interdependence between the so different social movements and a broadened agenda for, for the social movements. But of course, it's just a speculation from me at this time, because we do not know how and when this pandemic will end. Perfect answer, I think. <laughs> May I? Sure. I think it's a lovely question. Uh, and it's hard to, uh, to have a view on. I, I think that we all experience change at the moment in our ways of working, in meeting with uh, good colleagues, uh, doing teaching at university or keeping contact with parents. I mean, we are, we are really witnessing change in our daily lives or professional lives. Uh, I would assume that uh, our view on change, on the potentials of change here, is who will capitalize on uncertainty uh, in the meaning of, of who can actually either build some kind of uh, vision or build some kind of frame or something that could make people either less uncertain uh, or at least feel more secure because uncertainty is, is something that I, I assume that most of us express. And uh, potentially that would be more, well, going backwards rather than the assumption that we should go forward in this respect. So I think it depends on who capitalizes on the uncertainties that this pandemic is, is causing us. And whether it's the political parties who can do that, we'll see. Uh, whether it's kind of some uh, ideologist, we'll see. Or whether it's the social movements or some others, we don't really know. But I think that's, that's part, of the, uh, part of the puzzle, at least. I definitely think that um, having lived this experience uh, of being in the midst of a global pandemic, um, best case, you know, it, it'll give us the experience of seeing that change can happen and that change can happen quickly on, on everything from the individual to the global level. Um, and that change also can happen when our political parties or our political leaders are, you know, are really um, explicit and clear about the fact that, that we do need to make certain things happen. Uh, so, so in best case, I think that's something that can motivate us to start seeing the possibility of change towards a more just, a more sustainable world as well, now that we've had this experience. I think worst case, um, th this could even potentially also build the frustration even more when seeing that, okay, so we, we you know, change is possible when we all act together, change is possible. When our political leaders are really, you know, explicit about it, so why, why aren't they doing that more, or why aren't we doing that more on all of these other issues that are also acute and also really, really important? So, we'll, you know, we'll see what happens. I think one of the problems is, is uh, whether we conceptualize or think of, of, of COVID as man-made or not. Mm. The problem yeah. here is that mm. we think of it's, mm. it's a bat causing this for, for the globe. Uh, and it's, of course, it is, I assume. Uh, but uh, that, of course, also, okay, if that's pushing change on a global scale, uh, why haven't we managed to do that before? Mm. In the meaning of this, what is actually, so to say, the ground cause of change here? And... Um, mm. So I think that's also an interesting aspect of it. You mean like if when there is an external threat that kind of might have a unifying impact on people also to do some change.
but also by political parties or like the pe people in the government that can impose quite a fast changes because people are in actually emergency. So it's not an emergency framing, but we are experiencing emergency that can maybe, as, as uh, one of our audience says, decontextualize things that we, we normalized. So I think this was a really great final question. Um, so on this note, I want to end this session and thank you all for uh, joining us over Zoom. And thank you, Hokan and Frida, for being here. Uh, do you have final remarks uh, for our panel? If Thanks for organizing. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for and having And next us. time we will also invite more activists. I think it's not that we haven't searched for it, but activism is very time-consuming also activity. And often people are extremely busy also to join. And I know quite a bit of activists who say, we, we're tired of, you know, doing free job. <laughs> so whereas we are all somehow come here for, for our, um, as a duty, right? Um, although we, we like to be here. But that's also important reflection to make. Um, thank you very much for the audience here. Uh, thank you very much for the audience on YouTube. And thank you for coming here. Thank you. And thank you for the organizers. <laughs> <laughs>